Okay, so the second idea uh, that I want to explore a bit and the book covers is uh, this idea of ingenuity, you know, namely that the world is going to, uh, the world is changing fast, it's going to keep changing, and um, we, uh, the people who are leading well, really have the ability within themselves to adapt to a changing world. And uh, w what I just said is a completely ho-hum statement. Everybody knows this. Um, and th the fact is not kind of that, that it's some brainstorm to say the world is changing. We have to be able to adapt. Rather, the real issue is why are we so woefully inept at it? I mean, if you look at anything from, uh, you know, personal, very personal things, how people sometimes get stuck in patterns within their families or within relationships and they're unable to change in ways that they themselves will grow or their family members are able to grow. Uh, or if we take it on down to corporate settings, um, you know, if you look at uh, the list of uh, large companies 50 years ago uh, or most admired companies even 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's stunning to see how many of them fail or uh, are unable to continue to adapt. So, you know, we have this myth that there are companies that are great performers, adaptive, and so on, but the, the ability to do that over a long period of time uh, I is almost non-existent. There's very few humans and organizations who carry that off well. Uh, when I was at Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan, we once calculated that um, every year about 20% of our revenue was coming from businesses that we hadn't uh, been doing as recently as five years previously. So in a sense, we were almost reinventing ourselves every five years. And I'm sure many of you, whatever organization, b industry you're, uh, you're in, have a similar kind of feeling. I mean, this is reality, that, that we kind of live in this mode of constant reinvention. I um, had the privilege once of uh, visiting uh, Quantico, the marine uh, training base. It was a wonderful experience. They do a terrific job there. And one phrase that always struck, stuck in my mind, you know, the, the, the way the Marines uh, officers in, tra in candidate school go through these, um, uh, you know, incredibly taxing personal experiences, uh, sleep deprivation and going through difficulty and mud and all that kind of stuff that we see in the movies, you know. And the guy said to me, in the guy said to me at the end of the day, uh, what we're trying to do here is to make people comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable, which I thought, I mean, it's such a, a very simple phrase, but I really found it so valuable and so apt. In other words, you know, we can't solve the fact that we humans uh, don't really like uh, change. Uh, we say we like change, but we don't like change. You know, people like to do things the way they're used to doing them. They like to be, perform, and uh, act in relationships with other people the way we're used to doing it. Uh, and so his great, you know, the, the Marines' great insight, you know, which is a human insight, that we, we're, not try, we're not trying to remove discomfort, you know, the uncomfortableness of change and ambiguity and so on, those, that's going to be there, but rather to make people comfortable with it. In other words, to get ourselves a little more used to the fact that this is the way reality is and we have to be able to deal with it. And I think in one of these, uh, you know, what, what value could the Jesuits add to this issue, I think uh, the key is in one of these meditations in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, he has this meditation where he says, all right, imagine if you inherit an enormous amount of money, what ought you to do with it? And, um, you know, I guess, uh, it, well, a saint wrote this meditation. So your first instinct is to say, well, I guess the right answer is to give money to poor people and then to rejoice piously. And maybe that is the best thing we could do with um, uh, extra money, but in fact it's not the right answer in the meditation. What he says is that the first thing we need to do is to make ourselves free when we're on the verge of any major decision. We make ourselves free to pursue any legitimate course of action, any strategy we would say today, and then we make a choice according to whatever is our goal or objective. And for Jesuits, their goal, their objective is to do things that are ad maiorem dei gloriam, to do things that are for God's greater glory. So that's their standard, that's their objective. Uh, and the way, you know, internally they're trained, they're developed to try and operate 
is when they have a choice of how do I react in this situation, what do I choose, what career, what moral choice, they should try to be free uh, from attachments that might lead them astray of this uh, goal. Now, this sounds a little abstract, so let me, um, let me try to translate it to a completely uh, corporate, secular uh, example that anybody who has been involved in mergers or acquisitions would be familiar with. Um, you know, often we get situations where we're considering a merger between two, two companies that would be great for customers, great for shareholders, make perfect sense. And now we're at a point where we just have to figure out, um, so when these two companies merge, who's going to run the company? And so the chief executive of one enterprise, and then there's the chief executive of the other enterprise, and neither of these guys will accept the fact that in a merged entity, somebody must agree to be number two. And so the whole thing unravels. So in the language of this meditation, we would say that each of these guys is so attached to his or her own ego that it gets in the way of making a good choice, a free choice. And um, I think this is a, a very, a deeply valuable insight. You know, anytime uh, we're in settings, uh, organizational settings, and we're discussing uh, a choice or we're discussing any kind of a change, you really get to see people's attachments come out. You know, so a new way of doing something is on the table, and some people will resist it. They'll give reasons. But underneath, we feel like what's really going on is, oh, my God, you know, he's done it this way for the last 10 years. And he's just afraid of, uh, uh, that he's not going to be able to learn the new way. And so he's so stuck, so attached to his own fears that it holds him back from being able to change, take the necessary level of risk. Or somebody else might be resisting an idea because it was suggested by somebody who's new to the organization. You know? And so we, uh, uh, we're kind of attached to our own uh, state ideas of you know, who we are and how we do things. And we you know, have a kind of a subtle bias against somebody because he's new or younger or too old or black or whatever the heck it, it might be. Uh, or you see people who resist change uh, because uh, they're attached to status and afraid, for example, possibly of the risk of failure or of diminishing their own status or of getting something wrong. So you know, how do we become more ingenious, better risk takers? Uh, we tend to just point to the outside world and say the world is changing, we need to change too. Um, but that's not the issue. You know, the issue is uh, more that people might be able to look inside themselves and be able to take stock of uh, what sorts of attachments, to use St. Ignatius' word, what sorts of derailers inside us might hold us back from being uh, free enough to make the kind of choices that we need to make.